Well, it is my now pleasure to introduce Dr. Casey Gildersleeve, who is just to the right of me on this panel. Dr. Casey Gildersleeve serves as stroke medical director and neurohospitalist at Houston Methodist Willowbrook Hospital and assistant professor of clinical neurology for Houston Methodist Institute for Academic Medicine. He graduated from Johns Hopkins University Medical School and completed an internship and residency in neurology at Baylor College of Medicine. His vascular neurology fellowship was completed in July 2015 at the University of Texas Medical School in Houston. Casey joined Houston Methodist Willowbrook and the Houston Methodist Specialty Physician Group Neurological Institute in August 2015. He is a board certified in psychiatry and neurology and vascular neurology. His clinical interests are in aneurysms, brain, arteriovenous malfunction, CVA stroke, and neurological vascular disorders. And it is my honor truly to welcome Dr. Gildersleeve. Thank you, Debbie. Uh, and thanks to everyone who is uh, participating today, both as lecturers as well as the audience. And my topic today will be more thrombectomy capable stroke centers. So the overview of this presentation, we will start with the origins of how we actually came to uh, come to the term of thrombectomy capable centers and uh, review the requirements uh, to be deemed a thrombectomy capable stroke center. We'll talk about the patient needs, how that ended up uh, resulting in uh, the development of thrombectomy stroke centers, and then sort of future directions and, and how we plan to advance this sort of new stroke center certification going forward. So as most of us probably know, multiple clinical trials demonstrated the evidence of mechanical thrombectomy for selected stroke patients up to 24 hours from last known well. So the initial uh, clinical trials were up to six, sometimes even eight hours, and these are known by the acronyms ESCAPE, Extend IA, SWIFT Prime, Reviscat, Mr. Clean, and Thrace. And then later on, we actually were able to even further extend that window up to 24 hours with two, two clinical trials, the DAWN trial and the Diffuse 3 trial. So as you can see, over the past 20, 25 years, we've gone much further beyond the four and a half hour IVT, IVTPA window for treating patients and now have extended that to certain patients as far out as 24 hours, which has greatly improved uh, patient outcomes and minimizing disability post ischemic stroke. As a result of these clinical trials, the American Heart Association uh, updated their early stroke management guidelines, which resulted in a in significant increase in the utilization of endovascular procedures. Prior to the results of these clinical trials, there was a lot of anecdotal evidence that thrombectomy was uh, beneficial, but there was a difficult time in trying to figure out exactly which patients we should have. And so once we got all these clinical trials that repeatedly showed the same consistent result, we sort of knew as practitioners which patients we should be considering for these procedures. And so as a result of that, effective January 1st, 2018, the Joint Commission in collaboration with American Heart Association, American Stroke Association, developed a new stroke center, center certification. Uh, it's called the Thrombectomy Capable Stroke Center. And this was ideally used to capture patients without a comprehensive stroke center in close proximity to their location. So this is sort of a uh, schematic of the varying levels of stroke center according to the Joint Commission. So you have uh, the acute stroke ready hospital, the primary stroke center, thrombectomy capable stroke center, and then the comprehensive stroke center. And notably in the uh, thrombectomy stroke center, uh, these centers are able to do uh, at least 15 patients with ischemic stroke who require thrombectomy over a year or 30 patients over two years. Um, the distinction between a thrombectomy stroke center and a comprehensive stroke center is that the comprehensive stroke center can do more uh, neurosurgical procedures, for example, aneurysm clipping and coiling or even carotid stenting. Uh, it is noteworthy that uh, this distinction for a thrombectomy capable stroke center was made because in fact roughly 30 to 35 percent of primary stroke centers are actually performing thrombectomy procedures and so this was sort of a sort of go between between primary stroke center and comprehensive stroke center to allow physicians, practitioners, EMS providers to sort of know what hospitals have the equipment and capability to perform uh, the necessary t uh, testing and procedure if, if indicated. Uh, in addition, for treatment capabilities, the thrombectomy stroke center, IV thrombolysis, again, mechanical thrombectomy and IA thrombolytics, 
for the Comprehensive Stroke Center, as I mentioned, neurovascular clipping or coiling of aneurysms, as well as uh, carotid stenting if needed, in addition to the thrombectomy capabilities. And lastly, as far as clinical performance measures, the Thrombectomy Stroke Center, uh, largely they have eight inpatient STK measures and five ischemic comprehensive stroke measures compared to the Comprehensive Stroke Center, which has uh, eight inpatient stroke and 10 comprehensive stroke measures that they are assessed uh, to determine uh, suitability to continue with that uh, designation level. So this is a map of Metro Houston, and the blue stars all indicate, according to uh, SETRAC, all the uh, centers that are deemed comprehensive uh, stroke centers according to SETRAC. And so we can distinguish between SETRAC and DNV and, and Joint Commission. It is noteworthy that DNV, who also is a stroke certification uh, entity, has a similar designation. It's called the Primary Stroke Center Plus which is very analogous to the thrombectomy uh, capable stroke center that Joint Commission has named. And so to the north, we have uh, Methodist uh, in the Woodlands. There's also St. Luke's as well as Herman in the Woodlands. And then also the four stars in the center are the four uh, hospitals in the Texas Medical Center, Methodist, Ben Taub, St. Luke's, and Memorial Herman. And then even a UTMB down in Galveston. So this sort of gives you an idea of the layout of Houston and sort of geographically, depending on where a patient is how close a comprehensive stroke center is that could potentially treat them for a mechanical thrombectomy. So the need for thrombectomy capable stroke centers. So Lee Schwamm uh, published an article in September 2020 to determine the travel times between current and potential thrombectomy capable stroke centers and the nearest comprehensive stroke center and what proportion of those thrombectomy capable stroke centers were in high need areas. And so how they did this, they did three travel times, both the minimum commute, maximum commute, and the midpoint. And they were obtained at three different times of the day. So at 8 a.m., 12 noon, and 5 p.m. And the severity of the need of the areas that was served by the thrombectomy capable stroke center was classified by the number of time periods where the drive time to the nearest CSC from the thrombectomy center was at least 30 minutes or greater. And so the results using minimum drive times and 30 minute threshold for commute 29.5% of communities were in very high need areas. And even using the maximum drive times, 31.8% of communities were in high need areas. So again, we still have a lot of patients that don't have ready uh, immediate access to a thrombectomy capable center or a comprehensive stroke center in the event that they are having an ischemic stroke caused by uh, a large vessel occlusion. Uh, this was a, uh, a schematic from a, a article several years ago, uh, kind of delineating based upon population density, uh, how readily accessible either by air or by ground a patient is to endovascular procedure. This is dated back in 2014. But as you can see, uh, for a lot of, the, of uh, America geographically, uh, there are a number of areas in which a, a comprehensive stroke center was not within even a 60 minute drying or flying time. Certainly a lot of the uh, centers are centered around high population density areas as indicated by the blue dots. Uh, but certainly there's a large number of the c country that still doesn't have uh, immediate access to uh, thrombectomy. So questions for the audience. Uh, so what percentage of Americans will people guess have access to a thrombectomy performing center within 15 minutes? We fortunately have options. So 10%, 20%, 30%, or 40%. And then my next question, what percentage of Americans have access to thrombectomy performing centers within 30 minutes of them? And so 20%, 30%, 40%, or 50%. Everyone internalize their own estimation. We will have the results shortly. So recently, uh, Dr. Siraj, who is one of the uh, vascular neurologists at uh, UT uh, McGovern Medical School, published a study covering endovascular thrombectomy for acute ischemic stroke and current US access paradigms. Uh, this was a study of 1,941 stroke centers in the U.S., uh, and as I mentioned, of which 37% reported at least one thrombectomy case, so they would be considered thrombectomy capable, uh, not necessarily meeting the criteria needed for that designation by DNV or Joint Commission, but certainly they had recorded that they had done at least one thrombectomy case. Um, this data is from 2017. Uh, so uh, the nationwide direct access to a thrombectomy center, which was based on population data from the 2010 U.S. Census, 61 million Americans, or roughly 20% of individuals,
individuals have direct access to a thrombectomy center within 15 minutes, and 95 million or 30 percent of patients have access within 30 minutes. So this is a map uh, sort of similar to the previous map of what uh, where uh, patients have direct access. So the green uh, indicates regions of the country where patients have direct access within 15 minutes, and the yellow designates uh, areas in which patients would have direct access within 30 minutes. As you can clearly see by this uh, diagram, there is a large area of the country that still does not have direct access to a thrombectomy capable center or a comprehensive stroke center within 30 minutes. And as we all know, time is brain, and certainly in a large vessel occlusion, uh, patients can potentially be having millions of neurons dying every minute as long as that occlusion is persistent and reperfusion has not been achieved. So this uh, highlights uh, sort of the need uh, for more uh, availability and accessibility uh, for thrombectomy for patients who need it in a timely fashion. Uh, so this is a table of uh, that, and so the access actually does vary depending on the state that you live in. So for example, we'll look on the slide here, Alabama, uh, access for 15 minutes is about 10%, uh, Arkansas at 9%, however you have Delaware, obviously a smaller state, um, higher population density, roughly 36% of patients have direct access to a thrombectomy capable center within 15 minutes. So it definitely does vary depending on the state, depending on obviously high density uh, population cities. Uh, we obviously will talk about Texas. So Texas uh, with our population density of 96.3 per meter squared, uh, there are actually 152 stroke hospitals in Texas of which 65 are considered thrombectomy capable. Uh, again, this is just that they have recorded that they have done a thrombectomy case. Uh, so that's roughly 42.8% of all stroke hospitals actually uh, have performed a thrombectomy. And so for Texas, access for 15 minutes is actually only 22% of the state population actually has access uh, to a thrombectomy center or a comprehensive stroke center within 15 minutes. So the pro overall, the proportion of stroke centers that have thrombectomy capabilities varies among states from 11% to 83%. Uh, 15 minute direct access ranges from 2.3% to 38.6%. Notably, an overwhelming majority of the states, roughly uh, exactly 34, have 10 to 25% accessibility within 15 minutes. Um, and sadly, nine states had less than 10% of access uh, within that time frame. So again, this continues to highlight the need to try to uh, increase or enhance uh, accessibility of the thrombectomy stroke centers to uh, our patient population. Next set of poll questions. On average, what percentage of Americans, let's say we could increase uh, our thrombectomy uh, capabilities, uh, what percentage of Americans would have more access to thrombectomy if 10% of those non-thrombectomy centers were converted to thrombectomy capable. So our options are 5%, 15%, 25%, 30%. And a follow-up question, what if we even doubled that? So what if we made 20% of those non-thrombectomy capable centers now thrombectomy capable? What additional percentage of Americans would have more access to thrombectomy? 10%, 20%, 30%, or 40%? Once again, internalize your own uh, opinions and choices. Uh, so within that same article, uh, they actually performed an optimization model where they converted 10% of the most impactful stroke centers to thrombectomy capable. Uh, and it actually found that it enhanced direct access in each state. Again, that varied by state as well, but between 2.8% to 28%, with most states actually increasing access by about five to seven and a half percent. That 20% conversion, so an additional 10% conversion, actually yielded less of an overall value compared to the initial 10. So it actually only further enhanced the access by 2.1% to 9.2%, with most states having an additional increase by 25 to 5.2%. Uh, and so this is sort of that, uh, that data in sort of table format, and it certainly does rely on a number of factors. Uh, I would certainly say population density uh, certainly plays a role because if you have a lot of patients that are spread out, for example, Texas is really not that dense compared to a uh, number of other states. So uh, certainly having a higher population density, if you throw 
a thrombectomy capable center in a certain part of town, you're probably able to have access to more people compared to if the area is more spread out. But just to highlight uh, Texas specifically, so we mentioned direct access within 15 minutes is 22.1%. If we converted 10% of those non-thrombectomy capable centers to thrombectomy capable, that would add an additional 8.7% for a total of 30.8%. If we did an additional 10 on top of that 10, so total flipping 20% to thrombectomy capable, then we would be uh, at 36% for total coverage. So again, there's still a lot of work that needs to be done to try to get to a very comfortable and safe uh, uh, accessibility for our patients to be able to have direct expedient access to endovascular therapy if they need it. Uh, and this just sort of highlights more states, uh, but again, it depends on sort of the population density and those sorts of things, sort of how converting a non-thrombectomy to a thrombectomy center will gain access to patients for endovascular therapy. Uh, this is actually a map of what it looks like for um, Texas. Uh, so current direct access, again, is 22.1%. That's highlighted in green. The light blue, if we actually flip the highest endovascular centers to thrombectomy capable, you would get that light blue area. If you do an additional 10 on top of that 10, so a total of 20%, then that would be uh, indicated by the dark blue. Um, so again, uh, continuing to highlight such a large state, certainly most of our population density is in the major cities, Austin, Houston, Dallas, you know, certainly, uh, but there's so much of the state that doesn't have quick, expedient, direct access to um, thrombectomy if they need it. They would have to travel a considerable amount of time in order to have that procedure uh, completed, whether that was by ground or by air. My last poll question, and there is no answer to this one, but I think it's something that we should all consider um, at the conclusion of this uh, discussion is what should be our goal percentage of population with access to thrombectomy within 15 minutes and, with 30, and within 30 minutes. Certainly we would all like to have 100% everyone has access within 15 minutes and certainly unfortunately that's probably not um, for a number of reasons uh, going to be achieved but certainly something we should all aim for but I think we should all consider what would be an appropriate goal having viewed the data that we have available to us what should be an appropriate goal for our patients having access within 15 minutes and within 30 minutes. Excellent. Thank you, Dr. Gildersleeve. Thank you. So let me just ask, um, you very much established that there is a need. Um, talk to us a little bit about because of the need out there, um, how significant is it for hospitals to establish, whether it's thrombectomy capable or whether comprehensive stroke with regard to the infrastructure that is needed? Yeah, so I mean, that's certainly a very, very important component of it as everyone tries to obviously do follow the evidence, follow the science, do what they think is in the best interest of the patient. Uh, certainly becoming thrombectomy capable, becoming comprehensive is not just putting people in places. It involves everyone. Stroke is a collaborative, multidisciplinary approach. You're going to need the nursing staff to be competent, the procedurals to be competent, have engagement with your EMS to give you the appropriate pre-hospital clinical information uh, to be able to triage appropriately the patients for thrombectomy. Um, so it is vitally important that all hands are on deck to try to have a successful uh, program. Um, and so it's, it's obviously DMV and Joint Commission have their sort of guidelines and criteria what pieces you need to have in place. But certainly there's so much nuance to stroke and to stroke care that it definitely takes a full army of individuals and team members working together to make sure that that process is as efficient as it possibly can be. And then I'm also going to ask you a question. Uh, given the um, presentation by Stacy Moy prior to uh, your presentation, with technology, um, for hospitals that perhaps are not able to provide the infrastructure, um, how can these two things perhaps be blended together um, in order to, at the end of the day, save lives? Yeah, so I think one thing that has allowed uh, vascular specialists, neurologists in general, to be able to access 
uh, hospitals, campuses that may not have that level of expertise is through telestroke or telemedicine, um, which uh, I, along with another of our other colleagues who you've heard from today, are on a panel to cover some of our satellite hospitals in the community to be able to evaluate the patient and certainly expediently determine if there is an advanced level of care that is warranted. So if that hospital doesn't have the capability to do advanced multimodal imaging, to do the thrombectomy, we are evaluating the patient, we're reviewing their imaging, their testing, and if certainly a higher level of care is needed, then those specialists, those experts in vascular neurology are available at the bedside approximately as close as we can be to help our, our ED docs and our other staff and our colleagues to get them to a comprehensive stroke center or a thrombectomy capable stroke center to be able to get them um, the, the treatment that they need. So I would say if you don't have the technology, certainly trying to either have a relationship with a center that has that capability or certainly having staff uh, available on your campus to lay the expertise to help get the patient what they need. Excellent.